Welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Ben Hunter, Booktopia's fiction category manager, and this is a podcast about books and the wonderful people who read them and write them. Alice Pung is an award-winning writer based in Melbourne. Uh, She's the best-selling author of the memoirs Unpolished Gem and Her Father's Daughter and an essay collection close to home. She's also the editor of the anthologies Growing Up Asian in Australia and My First Lesson. Her first novel, Lorinda, won the Ethel Turner Prize at the 2016 New South Wales Premier's Literary Awards, and her new novel is called 100 Days. Alice, thanks for jumping on the line with me. Thanks so much for having me on your show, Ben. (laughs) The show, I love it. Um, Ah, podcast. (laughs) uh, I loved reading this uh, new novel. It's um, a small and mighty book about a troubled mother-daughter relationship. Um, And it's told from the perspective of Karuma, a teenage girl, the daughter of a working-class white man, an Asian migrant. And unlike your last one, this this has been published as a as a novel for adults. So, uh, what's what's driven you to write into that space? My book is about a sixteen year old protagonist, Karuna, and I wrote it specifically with a sixteen year old in mind. So that was my audience. Um, whether adults read it or whether young adults read it, I, I don't mind. It's it's a wonderful thing if it's a crossover book. Uh, but I wrote it, and you'll see that. It's a 16-year-old's voice, but like novels written about young people, it's not exactly from an adult's perspective, but you also get the perspectives of the adults in her life, her father, her mother, um, her employer. So I think it's one of those books that cross over. Yeah, I can definitely see it crossing over. And and it's it's described as as a kind of fractured fairy tale, which I like. Um, but reading about your history growing up in Melbourne's western suburbs and changing schools a lot, I get a vibe that you've used your own experience a lot in, in crafting this book. Is that right? Uh, I, I guess I haven't used my – I haven't been a pregnant teenager yes. <laughs> for starters. But yes, yes, you're, you're exactly right. You do get that vibe. So I'm the oldest of four siblings and – when I was younger, I had a lot of responsibility looking after babies. I was very stressed and very anxious as a young person from the age of nine onwards because of this responsibility. I also have three kids myself. So I have three kids in five years, which is nuts. Don't try that at home. <laughs> and it was so interesting. Becoming a parent myself, I found I was less stressed and less anxious. And parenthood has been uh, quite quite lovely, you know, <laughs> quite a wonderful thing to have happened to me. And that was only because I think I had all this responsibility as a kid. It's like that great quote from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. But as a child, you have no power. You just have a lot of responsibility. So I guess this book is for the children all around Australia who find themselves in very adult situations yeah, that's really well said. Um, the book has a really intimate voice. It's uh, a mother addressing a, a, a future child, an unborn child, um, and almost all of the action centres on this one girl and the mother character who is so dominant in her life, the biggest influence in her world. Um, can you describe both of those characters for the listener? Yeah, of course. So you see everything through the perspective of the 16-year-old girl, Karuna. So I guess automatically as a reader, you tend to take her side Um, because she's a young adult. Sometimes you're very myopic. You don't see the bigger picture, especially if your world is so small. Uh, But her mother, who she calls grandma because, you know, she's addressing her book to her future unborn child. Grandma is this big, ominous character in her life who actually locks her up for 100 days to keep her out of mischief and to keep her safe during her pregnancy. Now, Grandma is um, a stand-in for every migrant mother or every working-class mother who's been unfairly maligned, who might work two or three jobs and who will not often be in the best mood (laughs) and who 
feels that the only way to love her child is through control. And so that's the grandma character. Yeah, I think you really you really nailed it there. And I, I love her character. And you're oh, right. So she, <laughs> she, she works so hard for what seems like so little. Yeah, and, and it is uh, literally quite quite little as well because she's in the um, she's in the secret economy, you know, the the cash in hand economy. Yeah. <laughs> that is, so she doesn't have minimum wage protection or anything like that. And um, in these poorer migrant communities uh, uh, of the time, how is uh, life different for a young woman as opposed to a young man growing up? Oh. Yeah. Uh, of, of the time, so the book is set in the 1980s, Ben. But you know, I work with young adults around the western suburbs quite a bit, and it's equally relevant to this day and age. Um, life is different for young women. I've had young Sudanese women say to me, "My my mum is kind of locked me in the housing commission flat because she thinks I'll get up to mischief." And I'll say, what about your brothers? And she said, well, when they get up to mischief, it's not that big a deal. If I get up to mischief, I could get pregnant. (laughs) That kind of thing is still happening today. Um, I guess a a lot, this is not a cliche, but a lot of young women have more responsibilities, even just translating to their parents, taking their parents to medical appointments, looking after younger siblings, often teaching them, often making meals for them, because the whole family if you are in a, um, if, if you're not middle class, if you're all working class, the whole family has to pull together to make the family unit work. Yeah, it, it definitely seems like it's a, it's a lot of responsibility and a, not a lot of freedom for, for, for a woman in this community. <laughs> and that's, that's definitely what we, what we read here. Um, and, and I'm struck twofold with Karuna uh, with the sense of alienation she has, she's growing up in this, uh, uh, you know, in Australia as um, an Asian young person growing up in Australia with the, all of the racism that comes with that, um, uh, you know, and I'm sure that's contemporary today, but at the time I'm sure it was uh, uh, just as bad, if not worse. Um, but also her father has European heritage and especially going into the context of the salon, there's this, um, where she's put to work, there's this, uh, there's this spurning of lazy whiteness, but at the same time, this group of women, they all aspire to Western beauty. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you picked that up. That, that's a wonderful thing to have picked up. I really enjoyed writing the salon scenes just because it's such a common thing. You know, women who aren't white, um, aspire towards these these white standards of beauty. And, and I know I'm grossly generalizing, but it's been true in my life um, and my experience as well. Karuna is in an interesting position. When I was growing up, if you were biracial, um, that, that was such a wonderful thing because you didn't look Asian or you didn't look whatever non-white ethnicity you were. I had friends who dyed their hair blonde and put in blue eye contact so that they would look half. So Karuna is praised, you know, for her features that don't look Chinese or Asian, and yet she's um, criticised for her laziness, which is which is a pretty racist stereotype, to be honest, about white people. Yeah. And her experience that, uh, particularly, uh, when she moves into the tower block and is is locked away um, by the overprotective mother, uh, it's really hard reading. It's, it's, it's claustrophobic. Um, it's very moving. Um, but at the same time, this novel has a wonderful deal of humour in it uh, and so much authentic, real, familial love. How do you go about bringing all those elements together? Oh, I don't know, Ben. Thank you for these kind comments. You never know how your novel will turn out to the reader you have this great image in your head (laughs) you know it's like you're shaping something you've got a pegasus in your mind and you're making a play-doh horse or something (laughs) so i don't know but i'm so glad you uh picked that up because the whole novel is a novel about boredom and we don't have much boredom these days because we have smartphones we have the internet if karuna had the internet at the time 
this novel would not have been written because she would have been able to Google what to do if she fell pregnant, resources, places to go and how to get there. Um, I wanted to set it in a time that was quite socially isolated, even though they lived in very dense communities like social housing or in you know, Western suburbia. And I also wanted to portray this, I guess it also um, is a bit personal. I wanted to portray the sense of isolation I felt as a young teenager growing in a suburb, growing up in a suburb called Braybrook, where my parents always told me the outside world was quite hostile and you could feel it because, you know, people chucked rocks through our window. It was unsafe walking home because car loads of hoons might follow you and beat the horn and yell out things, things like that. So I lived a very indoors childhood and adolescence and had a lot of boredom and many uh, readings of the Reader's Digest. So <laughs> all those elements are true. And you brought the Reader's Digest in, in this book as well. Um, I, I loved reading <laughs> that. Uh, class is, is always at play here and... Um, your your character she experiences both uh, private and public education and no education um, in different phases, uh, and and you 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 contrast those experiences as well. Um, and and yeah, I, I found it really interesting reading that that you you said you'd gone through five different schools as a young person. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I went through a number of schools. So like my character, I experienced public private, state, selective state education, um, but I have not experienced no education. There's never been a period of my life where I dropped out of school or didn't study. So uh, a lot of the boredom in, in <laughs> the parts where she's dropped out of school um, are just that. What would, you, what would I do if I didn't have school to go to? Mm. But also she starts working at a young age, which quite a lot of my friends did. They finished school or didn't finish school and went to work in factories or went to work uh, as hairdressers, started their own businesses in their mid-20s, you know, that kind of thing. Alice, as if um, being an acclaimed author isn't enough, um, I understand you're also a, a lawyer or trained as a lawyer um, and you've been working legal research into areas like wage equality. Is, is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> cl class and poverty uh, explored and articulated in this book uh, just as fully as I think ethnicity and racism uh, are looked into. Uh, and altogether, it, it makes what's a really small s story so much bigger and more complex. Um, from the vantage point you have um, with the legal research, um, uh, with working successfully for years as a writer of colour and um, your your history, like growing up uh, as the child of, of parents who fled the Khmer Rouge, uh, what do you think is other misconceptions in the public debate around equality and racial justice and what needs to change most drastically for the next generation? Oh, it's interesting you mentioned class then because class is a big thing. We do talk about it in Australia, but we don't talk about it honestly. And there's something disingenuous about the way we talk about class where a lot of middle class people uh, find it a point of pride to point to a granddad or great granddad or even their dad who was working class and that, that's their... Uh, that's their point of authenticity or they might point about how they go to savers and shop secondhand and there's a there's a real pride in that you know <laughs> in, in all I've got working class heritage um, when I, I grew up in a very poor working class neighborhood and people didn't talk about class like that if you were poor you were ashamed you didn't gloat about shopping at savers you don't you know, it's a different level of living if, if you can make um if you can see it as a point of pride then maybe you're not that maybe you're not that disadvantaged i, I hope i'm making some sense no, <laughs> you're right. you know yeah so in my books i, I never um exaggerate levels of poverty because it's not fair to working class people to do that. 
And in terms of how that intersects with race, it's so important to talk about the working class uh, white Australians that I loved when I was growing up that helped me, that nurtured me and that made me the writer I am today. I always mention my best friend because her father was a One Nation supporter and he loved us, um, me and my brother, very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether today he's still a One Nation supporter. I wouldn't be surprised if he is. Uh, so I've always understood that people weren't their politics. So that's the place I write. I don't start from a place with you know, this great political framework that I've worked out, I have all the answers. I just start from character, and characters are really complex, and that cuts through the duality in which our media portrays class and race and gender and everything else today. <laughs> it's either you're woke or you're not woke, you're a horrible liberal voter or you're, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, um, idealistic greenie and those categories don't really apply to people in real life I don't think mm. No and maybe maybe especially not for people on the fringes and people who are, are, are absolutely doing it tough um, Yeah and, and that's what you're exploring the, here Oh sorry the other interesting thing Ben is that Karuna's father is quite racist yeah yeah <laughs> and he's not a politically correct person but he he has a thing he has a thing for asian women he loves them so that's a paradox too and i grew up knowing uh, men like that who were my father's age who just absolutely loved a certain type of woman uh because of their great what perceived to you know their, their great virtues hard workingness shrewdness, you know, um, you, and they, they would say, oh, Asian women are not passive, Asian women are feisty. <laughs> so, so that also counts as stereotypes as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's so much <laughs> at play. And um, reading this, you, you, it's it's a small book, but you get the sense of racism being something that's so much more sticky and insidious and complex uh, than than just pure hate. It's uh, it's something <laughs> it's something very diverse <laughs> in all its Yeah, it is. And um, you can love racist people if you're related to them. Yeah. And if you're made up fifty percent of them, what do you do with yourself? Do you hate yourself fifty percent? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> wow, yeah. Um, what do you hope readers get out of this book? Uh, who is this book for? Oh, that's, that's a great question. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I wrote it for a 16-year-old girl in mind. But what's been wonderful is I, I just really can't believe someone like you read this book and, and picked up so many threads that uh, I didn't consciously think about, you know, the, the private, public school and no school. I didn't notice that trinity happening there. So I don't know who this book is for, Ben. I really didn't think I'd have any males reading it to be honest because the cover is so pink and yellow <laughs> <laughs> i love the cover <laughs> um, what will you write next uh so uh, me and my friend shereel eng who is a very talented children's book illustrator uh, working on a children's book for a younger audience much younger maybe an eight-year-old boy <laughs> yeah and then who knows what next well we can't wait to have more and um we know there's some restrictions in Melbourne right now, but um, we can't wait for it all to be over and for you to be here. <laughs> and we can oh, meet you in person you. and we can hang out and sign some books together. Yeah, that would be lovely. I think I signed quite a lot of books for Booktopia, one of my big supporters. In fact, I think I signed half of my, um, you know, when my first book came out 15 years ago, I think I signed half of that batch. <laughs> wow. I thought, wow. I that, that's a wonderful thing. We didn't have Booktopia back then and we didn't have such big batches of books being printed. So, yeah, I feel good. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to do it in person next time and uh, can't wait to read more from you. Thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Ben. Thank you. You can find all of Alice's books online at booktopia.com.au.
Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or, if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia, Australia's local bookstore, at booktopia.com.au.